Hi, this is Randy Lee with Apex Tactical Specialties. We're here with our new AEK aluminum trigger, which we will do a quick diagnostic installation on. The first thing we need is we're assuming that you've already watched the installation of our duty carry or our competition AEKs um, for the springs, the sear, and the other important parts. So these are the three components that are included in our AEK trigger kit. We have our trigger, trigger assembly with the pre-inserted trigger bar pivot pin. We have our slave pin so that you can finish putting the whole trigger assembly back into the trigger bar or into the frame to help align the trigger pivot pin as you insert it. And for those people that have our duty carry kits, because of the additional improvement in leverage with the aluminum trigger, we've included a slightly stronger sear spring uh, for you to utilize in order to bring the trigger pull up into the five pound range of the duty carry or the competition action enhancement kit. We need to remove the two coil roll pins and the trigger pivot pin. So I'm going to do that. Remove the sear housing block. Remove the trigger pivot pin. And again, when you're removing the locking block, be careful because the, the takedown lever retainer clip resides there and it falls out pretty easily. Okay, that allows me to remove the trigger and the trigger bar. All right, so the next thing I need to do is remove the plastic trigger from trigger bar. So I'm gonna use a small punch. And I don't need to necessarily drift the pin all the way out just enough so that the trigger bar slides out of position. In the kit, what we did with the aluminum triggers is we've preset the pin, the trigger pivot pin, or the trigger bar pivot pin, um, most of the way, so it should be a little bit easier to install. There may be some confusion about whether I've got a forward set or a non-forward set type of trigger. The non-forward set, or the AEK trigger, has two small machine dimples in it that separates and distingu distinguishes it from the forward set trigger. So now what I need to do is reinstall the trigger bar. With that, we'll require a small punch. In some cases, it may be easier if you have a vise with smooth jaws to be able to press it in position so that the trigger bar doesn't pop out like it just did on me. That up just a little bit. Once it protrudes far enough, the very leading edge of the pin should hold it, should hold the trigger bar in position while I tap it in place. Okay, I want to make sure that 
that it is slightly below, below flush on the left side of the trigger body and slightly below flush on the right side of the trigger body. And I checked to make sure everything articulates correctly, that there's a good amount of free play so the trigger bar can move smoothly. Now I can reassemble it. In this case, this is one of the, the factory trigger return springs that I'm using just for the reason of the fact that this was a, a newer gun that we needed to install the parts in. So if it looks slightly different than what you have in your kit, um, that would be why. So now I'm going to put the slave pin in to hold everything together and to hold the trigger return spring in place. And I'm putting the bullet nose in from the left side to the right because the pin gets driven from the left to the right when it's inserted into the frame. So now the slide lock levers and the trigger assembly are in place. Now I can slide the locking block into position. The trigger pivot pin again is that solid pin that has a head, a larger diameter head on it and that's what I'm going to install from the left side to the right. Then it's just a matter of getting things lined up and into position. And it should push all the way through. Now I can reinstall the pins. Now be aware that Smith & Wesson has gone through several revisions on the trigger bars, so the loop and this particular slope has changed um, in the different iterations. So it may be that we may need to open the loop or change the slope so it engages the sear and allows it to drop out of the way of the striker. So we're going to just check that once we get everything together first. put everything in and then I'm only going to set the back end pin in about half the way just in case I need to pull it back out so again I'm going to check the, the function of the safety to make sure that the center trigger safety is actively blocking the movement of the trigger but when I press the trigger it rotates smoothly and freely out of the way and that the sear rotates and then again checking disconnect feature is I'm pressing the trigger to the rear and this one does not have a magazine disconnect if you have a magazine disconnect you want to insert an empty magazine into it to deactivate that lever so I'm pinning the trigger to the rear, holding to the rear, and pushing the vertical upright of the trigger bar off to the right. It clicks. That means the sear is now reset, ready to capture the striker as the slide goes forwards. I release off the trigger, and it resets. So now we'll check and see if everything functions appropriately. If you can see, in this case, we don't quite have enough over travel. I'm pressing on the trigger, it's rotating the sear, but the sear is not rotating all the way out of the way of the striker. And in some cases, with some guns, you may find that if you pull up on the slide as you hold the trigger back, that the striker will fall. In this case, it doesn't, which means I need a, a reasonable amount of, a little more reasonable amount of over travel. Forgot one thing. Pull this out of the way. Okay, for this portion, I'm going to need a set of feeler gauges, which you can pick up pretty much at any hardware store. 
or an automotive store. And what I'm going to do is if you look where the candy cane or the loop rolls over, there's a gap between this horizontal surface, that horizontal surface, and where the formation of the loop is. So what I'm going to do is use the feeler gauges to find out what that spacing is. This is a 6,000th feeler gauge, and it just slides in. So that's 6,000ths. What I'm going to do is I'm going to add 5,000ths to that, which means for a total of 11,000ths, I can go to the 11,000ths feeler gauge, and that's what I'm going to use to see what kind of spacing I have. Now the way we open the loop is I'm going to insert a small screwdriver into the surface or the left side of the loop and I'm going to rotate counterclockwise. It doesn't take a whole lot of force because the formed loops are not particularly it's not a, a severely heat treated surface which means it should flex pretty easily. And then I'm going to use my feeler gauge with the 11 thousandths and see if I can slide that through. And it's just a little bit tight, so I'm going to add just a little bit more. So again, inserting it into the left side of the trigger bar, rotating counterclockwise to open the loop up a little bit more. And that slides in. So now when I put it all back together, what I've done is effectively change the slope so that the slope engages the sear cam sooner. That allows the back end of the sear to rotate just a little bit further. Again, I'm doing this halfway just to secure the sear housing block. Putting the slide back on. Flipping the, the sear deactivation lever down, or back up, rather. I get a reset. It looks like I need to go a little bit more. So I'm just at that point when I lift it up on the, on the back of the slide, the striker fell, so I need to go probably another, in between two thousandths to five thousandths. In this case, I'm going to go an additional five thousandths just to make sure. The over travel is limited by the back of the trigger body, and that's the way I wanted to do it. And the reason I did that was because it takes all the stress off of these two pins. Typically, if you stop the trigger travel off of the back end of the trigger bar or the, the sear housing block, it applies stress to the pin. And what happens is eventually under recoil, this pin will start to walk out. The other thing that happens with the two-piece trigger is that if it stops, the bottom end of the trigger still is allowed to free float and move even further back. That causes stress on this pin that holds it to the upper portion of the trigger body and that's where things can walk out as well. So if you're using a factory stock trigger and have adjusted over travel um, based upon the trigger bar or the sear housing block, just be aware of that. All right, so we're going back in. Pop the pin out. This case, I'm going to go to a total of 16 thousandths. So I'm going to use a screw. 
screwdriver again, insert into the loop, rotate just a little bit, and we got 16 thousandths now. With this style of frame where it has the frame plug. Also be careful not to lose that frame plug. That acts as a spacer. There's two steel runners that run on the left and the right side that are embedded in the frame. And it's meant to have support from the sear housing block. And that spacer is what fills the void. If you leave it out and you start to shoot it, what happens is the flexing of the frame will end up distorting that and when you find out that you want to put one in it will have flexed to the point where in many cases you won't be able to put the sear housing block in. Alright, let's see if we've added enough. There we go. So now, at a total of sixteen thousandths, take up the slack, I feel the, the ledge where the slope of the trigger bar loop hits the sear cam, and now I have the appropriate amount of over travel. Ideally you should have at least a few thousands of an inch of additional of over travel, and the reason I say that is because under recoil, when the gun fires, When the gun fires and the slide moves back and the sear resets, if you don't have enough over travel on it, it'll mean that the side body profile of the candy cane isn't moving far enough back. And by that, what happens is if there's any sear flutter and you have no over travel, any type of flutter will cause the trigger bar to snap underneath. And when that happens, it'll occur under the recoil impulse as the gun is rocking back. Well, if that happens, it can hold the sear in a downward position to where it's just below the surface of the striker. So when the slide goes forwards, it will result in a dead trigger. So I have at least five to six thousandths of over travel measured from back here on the back end of the trigger. from where the striker releases. And basically the, there's no real litmus test to it other than the fact that when I pull the trigger and the striker releases I feel the trigger move just a little bit. It doesn't have to move a whole lot but it does need to move a little bit. And that's how you install the, the AEK trigger. If you have any further questions, please feel, feel free to contact us at www.apextactical.com. Thank you.